Hi guys and welcome to another topic based video. So the other week I watched Promising Young Woman which was awesome by the way and as I began working on my review for it, it got me thinking over things that have become synonymous with the rape revenge genre. What began as a footnote in my review of the film quickly became something that I felt needed to be addressed in its own video. So in this video I'm going to go over a variety of films, many rape revenge and some that just have rape in them and break these films down into four categories and I will go over those categories as they become needed. Basically I'm going to analyse where these films go right and where they go wrong. I'm going to start off with the film that inspired this, Promising Young Woman. This film ticks all the boxes. It addresses mental health, institutional and societal flaws and has many different forms of revenge, mostly focusing on psychological instead of physical and proving you don't need to include graphic violence to make a point. This film has no graphic violence, no depiction of rape and not even a drop of blood. For so long we've become accustomed to rape revenge films feeling like they need to be as bloody and graphic as they can be then I'm sure many don't even think that there's another option and there is. So this film gets to go into category B, which is well-executed rape revenge films that do not exploit the victim. Now let's bring up the original I Spit on Your Grave, practically considered a staple in the genre that was released back in 1978. There is so much horrifically wrong with this film. This is a film that from start to finish exploits the protagonist and yet continues to try to tell us this is empowering and about a woman taking back her power and her revenge. I could not disagree more. As the film begins, it really kicks things off by sexualizing the character. Now there's nothing wrong with the character being in a bikini on a lake, but it's how long these scenes are and how many there are that it's as if the visuals are implying the character had it coming. One of the rapists even says this at one point. Then we get to the actual assault. From the moment her terror begins to the moment it ends, it has taken up exactly 30 minutes of screen time. We watched her get terrorized and repeatedly raped and beaten for 30 full minutes, then she takes her time to recover before beginning her revenge. This is the part we're waiting for, right? That's what we all claim we want, to see the victim get revenge. So why is it her revenge counts for only 25 minutes of screen time? Less if you remove the setup scenes where no violence occurs at all. We spend more time watching her get brutalized than we see her get revenge, and if that's not bad enough, the film continues to exploit her during her revenge. One scene involved her stripping and seducing a man who is mentally handicapped and already easy to subdue. She could have handled him several ways, but she strips and gets him to have sex with her and then only during the act kills him. In another scene she seduces another of her abusers, bathes him and even masturbates him and then castrates him. Well, she could have easily found a way to mutilate him without meaning her performing sexual acts. The film from start to end exploits her and doesn't understand victims because in no scenario, even a revenge one, can I picture a victim of rape ever allowing or wanting a piece of her abuser inside her ever again. I know many hate the Twilight films, I don't care. There's a quote from the books I feel is relevant here. The character Rosalie, played in the films by Nikki Reed, was brutally gang raped by her fiance and his friends and beaten and left for dead. After she becomes a vampire, she hunts each down and brutally murders them, but she never bites them. She makes a point to say that she refused to allow any part of them inside her. Her revenge and trauma overrode her bloodlust as a newborn vampire. That kind of puts the trauma of a rape victim into perspective in this situation. That's why this film for me goes into the category A, rape revenge films done poorly that exploit their protagonist. Makes sense to follow this up with the 2010 remake. Now this film is extremely graphic, more so than the original. In the remake we watch the protagonist get brutalized for 31 minutes. However, we watch her get her revenge for 30 minutes, meaning it's about balanced out, and also means it had more revenge content than the original. And if I think over it, I would actually say the violence in this film is more graphic when it comes to the revenge than with the rape, but don't get me wrong, that is very graphic too. I think there is more detail put into the revenge in the remake and the film does not over-sexualize the character or exploit her to the degree the original did. I still don't think a 30 minute rape scene is necessary, but examining all the details, I'm gonna say this film goes into category B. I think it was better executed, not great, but better. Naturally, I have to follow this up with I Spit on Your Grave 2, which is just so many yikes. Starting at 17 minutes in, the assault and rape begins. The rape and brutalizing of our protagonist continues for the next 40 
45 minutes. For 45 minutes, we watch her beaten, raped, and tortured over and over again. When it finally comes time for the revenge, that comes in at taking less than 30 minutes. That means we spend more than half of this film watching her get abused. This film spends more time abusing her than it does letting her get her revenge, and when she does get her revenge, it feels very rushed, and in my opinion, it did not feel as graphic or brutal as what we watch her go through. This film is full of graphic violence, and all of it is extremely gratuitous, putting it firmly in category A. Moving on to I Spit on Your Grave 3, Vengeance is Mine. This is 100% graphic, but as graphic as it is, I do think it actually holds more pros than some of these others. This film is completely focused on the revenge, so big points for that. Being that it follows on from the first film, we don't have to watch the protagonist get raped again, thank god. So instead, we see this film deal with the aftermath. We see her in therapy, we see her working with other victims of assault, we see her suffering from PTSD, we see how her revenge did not bring her any peace, it did not change what happened to her, and we see because so much of her mental health is not being treated properly, she gets roped into continuing a path of revenge, but she truly loses what's left of herself when the last person she has formed a connection with is hurt, and after that, she's not just getting revenge for herself, but all other victims, and it eventually breaks her so much more she can no longer discern good from bad. So while maybe the storyline gets a little drowned out because of the graphic violence, it is there and it is a crucial story to tell so I put it in category B. Next is I Spit on Your Grave Deja Vu which in my opinion is the definition of gratuitous violence. This is so horrible and about brutalizing victims that I don't know how you could see it as anything else. It's not empowering, it's not progressive, it's just disgusting. This is a direct sequel to the original film and sees the family of the victim's rapists coming for revenge on her and her daughter 40 years later, and so begins them murdering and raping, and then the daughter going wanting revenge on those who wanted revenge, and it's just a whole lot of what the fuck. I don't even have to go into rape scene run times, the plot is enough to put it squarely in category A. Switching tactics for a moment, I wanted to look at another depiction of rape revenge I found interesting. What happens if the person getting revenge isn't the victim, much like with Promising Young Woman? Or more specifically, what if the person is male? Like 1974's Death Wish, for example. In that film, the protagonist's wife is murdered and his daughter sexually assaulted, which leads him to become a vigilante. The sexual assault and murder count for three minutes of screen time, and the revenge or vigilantism counts for 40 to 50 minutes of screen time of a 94-minute film. Hmm. Huh. Or what about Law Abiding Citizen? In that film, Clyde, played by Gerard Butler, is stabbed, gagged, and forced to watch as his wife is stabbed, raped, and then as she and their daughter are murdered. This scene takes under two minutes. It's graphic, but not at all gratuitous. The revenge begins at 14 minutes and lasts till the end of the film, which is a 109 minute film. As it is entirely about Clyde getting revenge not only against the men who killed his family, but on the system that failed to bring these men to justice. So this gives us something interesting to look at. Both films keep the assaults brief and will dedicate the entire film to telling the story and depicting the revenge in great detail. Why? Is it because the story is following a man, and in a man's story no one actually cares what happens to the women? Or is it because in a story where the victim is not the lead, no one cares about the victim? I don't know, seems like statistically in these films no one gives a shit about doing the victims justice. Nevertheless, I put these films in category B. I wanted to bring up 2014's Julia, 100% a rape revenge film, not the best executed one, but I would solidly place this in category B. The rape is established, but not depicted until a flashback that counts for two minutes of the runtime. Most of the film instead dedicates itself to finding out who Julia is, learning about her past, her mental state, her trauma. We see her in therapy and see her being sucked into a cult that is all about getting revenge and taking back your power. Now the violence against men in this film is incredibly graphic, it doesn't shy away from it, whereas the rape is actually shot but not lingering on the act too long, focusing on the character's face and expressions and showing other key elements within the scene relevant to the story later. It also has a story subject about the cycle of abuse, being that the person leading Julia down this path, while he is a male, he is a male who was a victim of assault and abuse and is gay, played by a gay actor. This itself rarely pops up. So there were a lot of interesting layers and ways of dealing with and depicting abuse and unlike most rape revenge films, is more focused on the revenge than showing the rape. What about Last House on the Left? 
This one I admit was tricky to figure out the maths of because the abduction, assault and murder of the characters cuts in and out between their story and others, but I'd say in total all of that counts for roughly 22 minutes of screen time and the revenge counted for 21 minutes of screen time. But this film, much like I Spit on Your Grave and most of its sequels and remakes, is filled with gratuitous violence. The violence is the point of the film. These films don't have big stories to tell, they're not teaching you about how to assess danger, they don't teach you about the ripper percussions of the acts and their catastrophic aftermaths. They don't even teach you about how flawed the legal system is. These are just films exploiting rape for their own gain and then using that as an excuse to depict even more violence for audience amusement. The remake of Last House on the Left is, in my opinion, even worse than the original. It starts off by over-sexualizing our soon-to-be victim and therefore exploiting her. We see her swimming or just being present and the camera is always almost caressing her and showing her figure. It even throws in a senseless shower scene. We're already going to have to watch her get raped but prior to that the film wants us to know how sexy she is, as if to say the events to follow are inevitable and her fault. In the original 70s film, the characters are fully clothed and not sexualized at all. In this, they are wearing more revealing clothes and one of the girls is acting relatively promiscuous. It's like the film is removing their innocence before the rape even happens. When we do get to the abductions and assault, this goes on for 24 minutes. Now in this version, the central victim survives, so we get to exploit her more. Yay! But when we get to the revenge, that is 20 minutes of screen time. Now while again the assault goes on a fraction longer than the revenge, what makes this film worse is how it treats the victims throughout the course of the film, but I'd say it's all pretty evenly graphic, it's just that again these films don't have a deeper story to tell. Let's look at the film Hard Candy, a film that at its core is about rape revenge and revenge or justice in general. It does not use graphic violence and relies mostly on its use of psychological torture. Even when you think it resorts to graphic violence, it doesn't, it's still psychological. It does all of this and never once feels the need to depict overly graphic violence or rape. Or try Spanish film Mientras Duermas, not a rape revenge film but a film that reveals rape has occurred and still makes you real without ever depicting it or even saying the word. Just through simple storytelling and character and story development you're able to put two and two together and that was effective enough. But on the flip side you have films like Blackout, which is like Devil but without the supernatural. People stuck in an elevator and turns out one of those people is a sadistic murdering rapist and it felt the need to show you how he hunts his victims and shows you the very uncomfortable scene of what he does to his victims and it is indeed sadistic. Now did I feel we needed to see it that detailed? No, I didn't. The actor's performance in the elevator alone gave you serious sadistic vibes. I didn't need graphic context. But then sometimes we do, to an extent, need violence or at least to be made to believe a violent act took place. Rape revenge film Even Lambs Have Teeth is very good at its depiction of revenge, but it actually fails to make you care about the victims. Now we see them abducted but never assaulted, but plenty is implied and I'm okay with that. But the characters never act traumatized or like anything bad has happened to them. They're pretty calm and collected for the whole ordeal and the crew never even go to the lengths to use makeup or anything to make them look as though they have been subjected to any forms of abuse. So because we are lacking these details, it actually takes away from the revenge having a strong point. Now the film maybe has one or two smart moments in there but it's far from empowering and fails to make you even root for the victims because to a degree it never depicts them as victims. So the revenge feels out of place and almost too violent for not a good enough reason even though it's implied the reason is good enough. So in this case an argument is made that while we don't need to see rape, if it is a key element in your film you do need to have something in there to to make the audience feel compassion for the victims and you can do it without depicting the act itself but even then it's still not a film with a strong story or message to share with its audience. Irreversible is notorious for its 10 minute long rape scene, it doesn't cut away, go to something else, the victim doesn't get a break, it's just 10 long minutes of Monica Bellucci getting raped. This film is very gratuitous and was this scene or more specifically the length of it at all necessary or relevant to the events of the film? In my opinion, no. Just show her in the hospital and tell us what happened and we still get the point. What about Salo or The 120 Days of Sodom, a film filled to the brim with rape, various other forms of sexual assault and just the most depraved things you can imagine. A film that actually made me throw up in my mouth. 
Now, I'm shocked by how praised that film is, with many excusing the depraved acts depicted in the film because of its subject of fascism and totalitarianism. I think there are a million ways to address the dozens of things this film claims to without doing any of what it did but still making a point. I find myself asking, if you have to depict sadistic sexual acts and depict them being inflicted on children to make a point about authoritarianism or capitalism, then I question the mental state of the person who thought that was the way to go. That of course brings me to a Serbian film, something I never wanted to talk about on my channel, but here we are. A film with overwhelming levels of hardcore graphic gratuitous violence and violence and assault being subjected to people of all ages. Now when I watched this film I stopped at a certain point because I found myself throwing my laptop away and curling up and crying hysterically while dry heaving. The director said, and I quote, This is a diary of our own molestation by the Serbian government. It's about the monolithic power of leaders who hypnotize you to do things you don't want to. You have to feel the violence to know what it's about. And many film scholars have defended this and backed it up. So basically, it sounds like any level of graphic violence is excusable if there's a political angle to it. I think that is a giant cop-out. I think the excuses people have made for films like this is horrifying. I don't care if this is meant to be a political allegory. If you think the only way to show people how the Serbian government treats people is by having a grown man rape a 30 second old newborn baby, then you are severely fucked up in the head and I think you need psychiatric help because I can't think of a time or place where that should ever be okay or excusable. Why do we make excuses for any of this shit? Because it makes for good discussion? The fact any person can have an intelligent conversation over the depiction of child rape and why that's okay makes me seriously question society. And if that's okay, then why the hell would anyone ever feel that depicting graphic rape against women would be bad? You know what is often considered controversial? The depiction of male rape victims, which a Serbian film has too. Now there's actually more out there than you think, but most of them are far removed from reality. They don't really depict rapes of men at the hands of women, which does happen. And from my short search, it seems that most often if it's in a film, it's because either the characters are in prison, like Shawshank Redemption, or it is the act of someone dominating power over someone else, like Pulp Fiction or The Kite Runner or Deliverance. In most of these films, the sexual aspect is completely removed and is more depicted as a power play, which while it does happen, Happen, the fact so many of these films don't want to depict the sexual part of sexual assault against men says a lot. Now there are many that do, but they are rare, especially when compared to films where the woman is the victim. Now I did mention I would tackle four categories and I mentioned two, but don't worry this will be brief. While I was hunting down many of these films and examining run times of violent scenes, I stumbled on something. Now many of these films I'd seen before, some I hadn't, but for the most part I was speeding through them, fast forwarding or jumping through five to ten minutes at a time to get to the moments I needed, and a new argument for what makes a good rape revenge film and a bad one came to light. If you're able to fast forward through the film jumping several scenes and can still keep up with what's going on or skip 20 minutes and have nothing in the story significantly change and you're still fully able to understand the film then that's a pretty strong indicator the film has no real story to tell or deeper message and is purely about gratuitous violence. Take I Spit On Your Grave 2 for example. You can skip 10 minutes ahead, not once, not twice, but four times and guess what? The character is still being raped. You haven't missed much. Skip another 10 minutes, she got away. Skip another 10, revenge has begun. Skip another 10, revenge is over, the end. What'd you miss? Nothing. Take a film like Julia, however, and if you kept skipping 10 minutes at a time, you're gonna find yourself confused in several places and find it very hard to understand what's going on or being able to keep up, and you may even miss the rape scenes altogether because it's so brief. Now, as I said before, it's not the world's best film, but despite its graphic violence, there is a story there, there is a message there, and its series of events are key to its storytelling. There is a lot going on to take in and reflect on, and so if you skip from one to the next, you're stuffed which proved that this film is not about the violence, but is story based. Now I'll use that same principle for many of the films I've talked about, and they each line up into these corresponding categories. It wasn't something I was looking for or even thought to look for, but it was surprising how quickly fast forwarding through most of these films showed you that most rape revenge films are really about exploiting victims as opposed to teaching the audience anything. 
While some films get it right, I think there is a lot to go over and dissect in this subgenre and I hope I've given some people a good place to start. Too many films think that violence doesn't need a purpose and too many of us accept that. I think in films not only on this subject but any subject need to do a better job at thinking over if the violence in their film is necessary to the story and does it have a purpose. Don't get me wrong, sometimes I love me a gory film, but if the subject of the film is dealing with something as sensitive as rape, then more thought should be put into the story, otherwise you're just using it for your own entertainment and rape should never be entertaining. I hope you have found this video interesting or mildly informative. I'm going to go and binge watch kitten videos and comedy specials because this was not a fun subject to discuss, but one I felt was necessary. Thank you so much for watching or listening. That is it for this video. Thank you as always to my awesome patrons. I hope to everyone watching this, wherever you are, you stay safe and healthy. I hope to see you in my next video, but for now, bye! Thank you.